Everyone, welcome to this episode of the Outdoor Gear Review. Today for this adventure, I am out for a survival trip. This is another video in the series which I call Survival with This. I'm going to hike over here to the shade and we'll do a little bit of talking so you all can learn what this trip is all about. With this survival episode, I have yet another survival product to demonstrate how to use, demonstrate when to use it, when not to use it, and also to share with you all the pros and cons. What I have here is a Mylar survival blanket. It's also known as a survival tarp. It's a little bit of a mixture of the two products. It's a blanket on one side, but it has grommets so you can string it up like a tarp. These are interesting survival products that I have quite a bit of experience with. In this episode, I will be showing you all all about them, the good and the bad. Now with where I'm at, this is truly out in the middle of nowhere. And the conditions are serious, especially tonight. Right now, it is 45 degrees Fahrenheit. It's also windy. Tonight, the low is around 23 degrees. So without a doubt, I'm going to need this shelter and I'm going to need to use it in a way to maximize its potential. Now, before I talk more about that, I do wanna talk about this area right here with this field. This is a very interesting place. This is an area where I really have to be careful. Right now we're in fall, it's getting cool, but not cold. This is rattlesnake territory. There are very large timber rattlesnakes in this area. In fact, a couple of years ago, about five miles from here, I almost stepped on a huge timber rattler. So uh, yeah, I know all about the rattlesnakes in this area. If you're familiar with rattlesnakes, you know that they prefer temperatures between 70 degrees and 90 degrees, but they can be active with temperatures below 50. In fact, in areas like this, in the spring and also in the fall, you will likely find them. And that's because they are coming out of the forest. They come out into the field, into the sun, where it's roughly 15 degrees warmer. So you really have to be careful in areas like this, even more so than deep into the forest in the cooler months. The next thing that you have to pay attention to are rocky areas like this. It's dark in color, it will become warm, and snakes will come out and they will lay on rocks like this for that warmth. So anytime that you see rocky outcroppings, you definitely have to be careful. I will show you all on the satellite imagery where I'm at right now. And as you can see, out in the middle of nowhere, I found a very old trail <laughs> that comes out of the woods back here on the uh, 2016 forestry map. That is a trail that has been decommissioned. There's no signs. It's a little more than just a deer path. All in all, I'm not familiar with this area to any great degree at least. On the map, it's marked as a wilderness habitat and I have no idea why this has been mowed, but it has been. I'd say within the last two months. That tree was struck by lightning. It is the only thing that's been burned and close to the base, it's actually just blown apart. It's pretty interesting. With this series, Survival With This, the focus is on the survival shelters, survival products that are out on the market. Unfortunately, there's so much marketing BS surrounding these products. Oftentimes, 
those who purchase those products have a false sense of what they are capable of or when to use them or how to use them. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Go on Amazon, type in survival shelter and look at the pictures of the products that pop up. Everybody's laying around in their front yards. They're smiling, having a good old time. Well, let me tell you this, folks. Using a survival shelter because you have to sucks. Every trip that I've done, every one of these survival trips has been absolutely miserable. There's nothing fun about it. And tonight is going to be especially awful because it's going to be so cold. And that's okay. I want to show you all the truth about these products. I will film these videos, I will test out these products and show you all my experiences so you can take that information and use it practically in an emergency situation. The scenario for this trip is fairly simple. Out for a hike in the wilderness, in the backcountry, and for whatever reason, can't make it out. Since I can't make it out, I have to rely on my survival shelter. And that, my friends, is exactly what I will do. So, I am at a crossroads here. I can go this way, and by looking at the map, I can tell that it drops off into a valley, goes down to a big creek. We'll skip that. It will be colder in the valleys, especially next to that water. So I will stay up top and we'll stay warmer because of that decision. One of the most deceptive tactics when it comes to survival products is the terminology. Oftentimes you will see the terms like ultimate survival shelter, heavy duty, capable of providing confidence to survive in extreme conditions like hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, wildfires, etc. Seriously folks, that last one was quoted directly from a survival product page and it's complete nonsense. The truth is with most survival shelters that are out on the market, they are good for very calm conditions with temperatures above 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Once you go below 45 degrees with most survival shelters, if you have nothing but that shelter or that Mylar blanket or whatever it may be, you are in serious trouble. This is something that most survival product makers will not tell you. And that's unfortunate because people buy these products, they take them out, and then they're in for a world of hurt. Above 45 degrees, anyone can survive without an emergency product as long as they can stay dry and they can protect themselves from the wind. This here could be a fantastic campsite. For now, I will keep going though. Let's see what's out here. I may not be able to hike all of this. These old forest trails and forest roads, they could go on and on 20, 30 miles. You just never know. Other terms that you will oftentimes hear about, especially with Mylar products, is how much they reflect your heat back to you. You'll see 93%, 90%, 70%, and all of those numbers are bullshit. They're BS. In the previous survival episode, in which I used a Mylar survival product, I went over the science behind that and why those numbers are complete BS. If you haven't watched that episode, make sure to check it out because it could save your life. I go over all the pros and cons to using such a product. Most people think they will save your life, but the truth is they could end it. So make sure to know how to use those products correctly before you head out. Other terms that you will sometimes hear are waterproof, which means theoretically it should not leak if they're being honest. You will also see water resistant, which means it will leak with enough moisture. You'll see windproof, wind resistant. You will see tear proof or tear resistant. And there's a huge difference between proof and resistant. With all of the survival products that I've tested out, I've yet to find one that is truly tear proof. And when they say they're waterproof, either that's false or it's 100% waterproof and also 100% non-breathable. Take a Mylar bivy for an example. 
you slide inside of one of those, your body's releasing moisture, those things do not breathe, and you will become soaked in 15 minutes. It really doesn't matter most of the time when it comes to the jargon, because it's just all marketing nonsense. And that is a point that I really wanna drive home. The majority of these companies will say anything to make a dollar, when honestly you're better off preparing in different ways, in other ways. For now everyone, I'm going to hike, look for a good spot to set up. And that's because the sun, as you can see right there, is about to touch the ridge and go behind it. With the temperatures being so cold tonight, there is something that I need to focus on so that I can survive the night. And again, this is something that most survival companies don't talk about. Once you go below 45 degrees, you will have to have a way to stay warm. A Mylar blanket, a Mylar bivy, a survival shelter, it's not enough to insulate you. In fact, none of those products insulate. At the very best, they reflect, and there's a huge difference. Now everyone, this is interesting. It's flat, it's open, it's breezy, but with my tarp, I can block that. I can use this tree right here as a partial setup. Maybe go this way with it. Yeah, that'll work. It's not a great setup by any means, but when it comes to survival, that's how it works. Once you go below 45 degrees, as I mentioned before, that's when you have to have some sort of heat source to keep you warm. Your body cannot handle it below that degree by itself. That really does present one of the biggest issues when it comes to survival shelters. A Mylar blanket, a Mylar bivy, that's not enough to keep you warm in conditions that cold. So you have to have either insulation layers from clothing, a sleeping bag, or whatever, or you have to have a fire. It's the only way to make it through the night. Due to that factor alone, it creates a huge problem when it comes to survival. You have to have the foresight to stop early enough to gather firewood. So right now it's about four o'clock. The sun will go down in about an hour and a half. So I have to make that decision. Hey, I can't make it out in time. I'm going to stop now set up and gather firewood. The act alone of gathering enough firewood to make it through the night is not really feasible. This right here is an awesome find. I could tie up my tarp to the tree over here. I can use this side, tie it off. With this Mylar tarp blanket, it's about seven feet long, five feet wide. It weighs right around a pound or so, and it costs roughly 20 bucks. If you plan to use one, you have to prepare to use it. You have to have the right materials, pieces of gear, and so on. For an example, you have to have some cordage. It's always a good idea to have some tent stakes, but not any type of tent stakes. You have to have long narrow ones because the grommets on these emergency tarps are very small in truth they're ridiculous All right, so everyone check this out. This is the emergency tarp. The one thing that you really have to keep in mind with these is that they are extremely fragile. You could tear this literally like a piece of paper. So oftentimes you will see in the pictures of these being set up, pulled taut, 
like a slanted tarp. That is not what you want to do with a shelter like this, with an, an emergency product like this. Because of this mylar material, you do not want it flat and you don't want it tight. What you want is for it to basically wrap around you. So tonight, I will sit inside of this and you can see how it's kind of wrapped around me. I will have my fire here. That heat will reflect off of this mylar and surround me. And if I'm lucky, I will be able to get some rest tonight. The next step is to rake up as many leaves as I possibly can to put here on the ground. That will be my insulation from the cold ground tonight. Now, I do have a mylar blanket, which I'm going to lay down over the top of those leaves. That way, hopefully, I can keep in all the spiders and ticks and everything else that's using this material as insulation. Also, since it's a mylar material, it will reflect back some of my body heat and also some heat from the fire. So again, with this type of setup, you really have to prepare to use it. You have to have the right know-how and you have to have the right gear with you to set this up. Again, with these grommets, you would not be able to hunker this thing down low enough to the ground if you did not bring some sort of stake with you. The holes here are super small. It would be difficult to find a stick small enough and strong enough to stick in there to anchor this down. It's like these companies have never tried to use these products in a real life survival situation. It's pretty sad actually. That's about six, seven inches deep, and that's enough to give me some good insulation from the ground. With survival, it's not about being comfortable, it's about surviving. Now everyone, it's time to collect firewood, and as much as I can collect. So right now I'm just going for the easy stuff, stuff that's right along this road here. As I'm sure you've noticed, I put my backpack on. And that's because this backpack and everything that's inside of it, it's my lifeline right now. And because of that, I'm not going to leave it behind. It's too valuable for it to get taken by a hungry bear or something like that. While I'm working away, everyone, I'm making sure to go nice and slow and to pace myself. The last thing that I want to do is sweat. If I run around here and sweat, it will put me in a very dangerous situation. A situation that I may not be able to walk away from tomorrow. It is time for an update. 
The sun is officially gone down. It's getting dark, it's getting cold. I have gathered as much firewood as I possibly could. And I did so without sweating my brains out, which is super, super important. Now, with all of this firewood, I have not taken the time to break it up or anything like that. I will simply have to do that throughout the course of the night. It's one of those things. Do you have the time to break it up in a survival situation? No. No, you don't. In most cases, no. With the sun going down, I'm going to get my fire ready. I'm going to prepare for it. But I'm not going to light this up until I absolutely have to. I will wait until the point where I'm cold and then get it going. It's vital not to waste any of this firewood, to only use it when I need it. While it would be awesome to have the fire right now, that would be a huge mistake. The Mylar blanket had this piece of paper. Now this is interesting. This says reflects up to 80%. <laughs> what does that mean exactly? That's simply marketing nonsense. I'll tell you what everyone, it is getting cold. Might as well put on my jacket and all that. And since I'm going to do that, I'll go over what I have with me. So one liter of water or what's left of it. I have my miscellaneous kit which I have shown off in the previous survival episode. I won't go through that again. Camera bag, this has batteries, lens cleaner and all that stuff. I brought with me four stakes to use with this tarp. And again, that's because this tarp features these ridiculously small grommets. And when you're taking out a product like this, oftentimes it's to protect you from moisture and from wind. Well, there's no way to anchor this thing to the ground easily. You can always tie it to something else, but that uses valuable resources. So I brought four of these stakes, I brought some cordage. I don't remember what the name of this is. I'll flash it on the screen for you. It's pretty good stuff. This features my gloves and my toboggan, which I will go ahead and put on. This is always in my cold weather day bag. Just as important as a first aid kit or even a fire kit. I have some nuts. I have some sort of oatmeal bar. Inside of this bag, this is my power kit. I always have this with me, and that includes a battery bank and my headlamp and a charging cable for my phone. And lastly, I have my down jacket. And that's it. I should mention that inside of my miscellaneous kit, I do have some matches. I don't think I mentioned that last time. I always have a way to start a fire with me. And speaking of which, in my jacket pocket here, I have a lighter and it's always there. I have my fire pit here, the fire will be going. I have my insulation, mylar blanket. And folks, this is my night. This is my night. Now, of course, I can make adjustments to this as it gets later and cooler. Like, uh, for an example, I may pull this mylar back just a little bit and bring the fire in just a little bit closer. But as is, this will radiate back a lot of that heat. I can even lower this to get it more over the top of me. As far as advice goes with one of these tarps, be very gentle with them, never pull them tight. Always have some slack in it. Again, they will tear very, very easily. They could say that they're reinforced and all that nonsense. They're not. You could tear this by hand. The grommets will tear out with just a little bit of effort and force. So be very, very careful with these. It's funny, everyone, with most of the survival products that are out on the market, the truth is they're pretty much junk. Pretty much junk. And that goes for most of them. Not all, but most of them. I had a viewer email me not too long ago after seeing the Mylar Adventure survival trip, and he asked me, what do I recommend for cold weather? And my recommendation is this. Take a tarp, take some insulation layers, make sure to have multiple methods of starting a fire. And that's the bare minimum. For the most part, I would forget about survival shelters, emergency products and stuff like that because they are useless in most cases. Most of them are so fragile that they will tear apart in a storm, I mean, even by just sitting on this Mylar blanket, this thing is getting torn up. It's that fragile. 
this tarp is that fragile. A real tarp is definitely the way to go. Make sure to know how to set it up in multiple ways so that you can protect yourself. You can block the wind 100%. You can block rain and snow and so on. I'm taking the last couple of minutes of light, preparing some firewood, doing multiple stages, small stuff to larger, to larger, to larger. This is something that I will have to do continuously all night long. As I go through it, I will have to get up, process, I did build a fire pit. I found some rocks up and down this road, grabbed those, brought those in. The backside here is higher than the front, so more heat will go towards me. Also, as these rocks heat up, I can take those, bring them in, and hold on to them. To get this tie-off point here on the back, I took a rock, put it on the other side, pulled it to the material, tied around it, and then staked it off. Here with a stick. Sometimes you have to think outside of the box to get things to do things that they were not designed to do. As it is, it's definitely getting cold. Temps are in the mid 30s right now. It's probably about 35 degrees. Luckily, it's not very windy. But um, yeah, the chill is definitely coming on. One thing that I will do to stay warm is a little bit of exercise. It's one of those things where you have to be careful on multiple fronts. You don't want to sweat, and also, you don't want to go through too many calories either. For an example, with this scenario, I was out for a day hike. I had breakfast this morning, I had coffee this morning. I did not have lunch because I figured I would be back. That's not the case, so I've had no lunch. I do have those snacks. I'm hungry, but I'm not going to eat those right now. I will wait until later on tonight and I will munch on those. Having that food in my stomach will make me warmer as my stomach digests it and whatnot. So the camera makes it look like this, but that's not the case. This is what it actually looks like. <laughs> Here we go. This camera has insane low light performance and it can make nighttime look like daytime, but no, it's getting dark, it's getting late. I'm going to do just a little bit of walking up and down this road, warm up a little bit, right after I grab my backpack. There we go. As I mentioned before, I recommend taking your gear with you. If you value it, do not leave it behind. I'm not sure if I've ever talked about this experience before or not. When I was young, I was out camping in this makeshift shelter, right? And there was this fox in the woods, and every so often I would see him like peeking his head out through the rhododendron. And uh, I went down to the creek to get some water. I hear some rustling, and that fox comes running into camp and grabs my sandwich, which was like in a Ziploc bag or something, took off. <laughs> it ran off with my dinner. That is nature right there. If you value something, you take it with you, or you might be sorry. Time-wise, everyone, it is about 10.30, and I'm freezing. <laughs> it is cold. I tell you, that feels amazing. As you all can see, I have a small fire pit, and that's because I want a small fire. A small fire means going through your wood at a slower pace, with a large fire, a large fire pit, that means you'll be going through your firewood much, much faster. And that is not a good thing to do. I'll tell you what, everybody, this is nice. It's radiating off the back of this, coming back to me. It's also radiating off the floor. Yeah, that feels good. I'll tell you what, I am in for a very long night. There's no doubt about it. In a survival situation, though, it's always a long night. For sure. Let's lay down and check this out. 
Oh, man. I will be honest, folks. This feels good. This is comfortable, too. The leaves underneath are giving me a good separation between the ground and myself. I should say this, everyone. Mylar material is highly flammable. This stuff will burn easily. So you do have to pay attention. Watch for embers and whatnot because this stuff could be easily destroyed. About every 30 minutes I get up, add more to the fire, and I'm still working on building a big base of coals and whatnot. That way I can burn the larger stuff. As is, we're getting there. I've been laying here for about an hour now. Doing pretty good. Very warm, very comfortable. Getting to the point now where this fire can really burn the big stuff. And that's good. It's a little bit after 145. It is definitely getting cold. This is the warm area <laughs> right here. But if you go just right outside of this, it's, uh, it's pretty cold for sure. I'm at the point now where I'm going to begin eating. So I have the nuts, I have the oatmeal bar, and I will munch on those for the rest of the night. That is good. <laughs> I've been starving for hours. I've been laying here and my stomach's just been like talking to me, so hungry. I'm not going to eat it all, not right now. Just little by little. I'm resting while I can here and there, maybe 10 minutes, five minutes. The most important thing is not to fall to sleep. You can rest, don't sleep. Step away from the fire here. As you can see, it is cold. I spoke about this a bit in the previous survival adventure. But when it comes to having to survive, being out for a trip like this, where it was something that you didn't plan for, the most important thing is that you stay calm, think clearly, don't overreact, stay in control of your emotions. For me, I've done this basically my entire life. My brother and I, this is how we went camping. We had nothing all the time, so. <laughs> Being out in the woods with some plastic was, you know, what we did. For most people, they're going to be not happy, that's for sure. They're not going to have a good time. And that's why you have to stay on top of your emotions and your thoughts. Don't let your mind go crazy. Focus on what you have to do to get through the event. That is incredibly important. What you have here is more important than all of this. I'm going to lay it back down for a little bit. Oh, see you all in a while. gone through quite a bit of firewood here. I would say at least half of the big stuff that I drug out of the woods.
Morning has finally arrived. It's a little bit after six o'clock. The sun's coming up and it has been a very long night. That's for sure. I fell into a hard sleep around four o'clock and woke up not too long ago. The fire was pretty low. So I got it going again, warming up. Oh man. The one thing about this trip with using this shelter and whatnot is that I was able to pull this off because I got lucky. And that is a big factor when it comes to surviving and also the use of survival shelters. I came out here, the weather was good, everything was dry, it didn't rain, the wind died down. Those are all factors that were really in my favor. If the conditions were different, this shelter here could have been worthless. As I mentioned before, this thing is so weak, it's so flimsy. Let's say it was really windy. This thing could have torn, it would have torn. If it was raining or maybe it had rained, everything was wet, I couldn't get a fire going, this here would benefit me very little, very little. And it all boils down to the science. I went over all of those numbers in the previous survival episode, so make sure to watch that. But in truth, Mylar, while it does have its pros, it has major, major cons. There's a right time, a right place. And the biggest problem when it comes to these survival shelters is this. You have to plan to use them. <laughs> and this is especially true, again, with temps below 45 degrees because something like this will not protect you. It's not enough. So you have to plan to gather firewood. You have to e either have a fire going or you need substantial insulation layers. Otherwise, a mylar blanket, a mylar tarp, this is not enough to keep you alive. And that's the case in good weather. As the conditions get worse, this performs even worse. The one problem about staying up all night feeding a fire is that you sleep very little. And because of that, like, uh, your mind doesn't really perform that well. And so I can see it already, like I'm a little bit slow. Luckily, I was able to sleep some last night, so that's good. Definitely not enough. Let me tell you, everyone, it is a cold morning. Once you get away from that fire, without a doubt, it was that fire that made this possible. The sun is coming up, and this video is done. Mission accomplished. Throughout the course of the night, while sitting next to this fire or laying next to it, I was taking some notes here, basically just gathering my thoughts about these survival products. And I think it's a good way to wrap up this episode. So without a doubt, these products helped me make it through the night. But would I put these in my day pack and carry them with me on a regular basis? No, no I wouldn't. They helped me make it through the night, but they were not essential by any means. And what they added to my overall survivability was very low, in fact. I, I could have easily have sat right next to this fire all night long and accomplished the same thing that I did. Without a doubt, this does reflect back some heat. It does block the wind. It could potentially keep me dry, but it's so limited. It's so weak. I personally would go with something else as far as a survival shelter or part of a system. The overall durability of these two products is very low and I would go with something that's more substantial and also I would carry more insulation layers with me. Neither one of these products are going to replace a nice warm jacket or a good old-fashioned tarp. Yes, a tarp is a little bit heavier but you can accomplish the same thing <laughs> as this here. You can use it as a reflector wall if I had just a regular tarp up, I would be just as warm with this gone. So, Yeah, folks, that's it. I'm going to let this fire burn just a little bit longer. I will take the rest of my water, put this out, and it's time for me to get out of here. Oh, man, I tell you, this fire sure does feel good, though. There's no doubt about that. Whew. Well...
everyone thank you all very much for joining me for this trip make sure to sound off in the comment section down below share your thoughts about the emergency blanket slash tarp what do you all think good reliable emergency product or is it slightly useful junk you decide comment down below thank you all very much for joining me for this trip on to the next adventure if there's a survival product that you would like for me to test out, make sure to sound off in the comments. I do appreciate it. If you want to support a channel that is 100% agenda free, a channel who's not trying to sell anything, a channel who's never sponsored, I refuse to do sponsorships on my channel. I don't do affiliate links. In fact, I don't sell anything. I don't care if you buy anything. That's not what this channel is about. The Outdoor Gear Review is all about passing on information and that's it. Take care, everybody. Strength and honor. Goodbye.